now recognize our second panel of witnesses, the Honorable Kim Whalen, or, uh, is the control Wallen is the controller of the State of Nevada. And Nevada is one that I always have to get right because I want to say Nevada and then I get yelled at. Uh, Mr. Pac Patrick Quinlan is the Chief Executive Officer of Rivet Software. Ms. Ellen Miller, a returning guest, is the Executive Director of the Sunlight Foundation. And, and, and Craig Jennings is the Director of Federal Financial Policy, but was not on my, my list here. But thank you and welcome. And thank you for your work on OMB Watch. Pursuant to the uh, committee rules, would all witnesses please rise to take the oath and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. This panel is every bit as important as the first panel, but there are four of you. So we would ask that you very much summarize your entire statement to keep it within five minutes and allow time for questioning. Your entire written statement will be entered into the record. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, attend the hearing today and uh, thank all the members of the committee also. My name is Ellen Miller, and I am co-founder and executive director of the Sunlight Foundation, a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to using the power of the Internet to catalyze greater government openness and transparency. We take our inspiration from Justice Brandeis's famous adage that sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. The Sunlight Foundation focuses on transparency and accountability for government by developing databases, tools, and policies that illuminate the influence behind decision making. We want citizens to understand the outcomes of government decisions. We want them to be able to hold government accountable for its work. We have long been involved in improving federal spending transparency. We funded the first publicly available database of government spending, fedspending.org, that was developed by the nonprofit organization and my colleague on this panel's organization, OMB Watch. We have followed earmarks, analyzed grants and contracts, scraped the House disbursements, identified Federal subsidies, and dug into tax expenditures. Recently, we have spoken out against Congress's deep cuts in funding for e-government programs. Yesterday was quite the day for government transparency. The Chairman introduced a sweeping transparency bill, the Data Act, that would transform how we track Federal spending, establishing an independent body to track it all on a single website, requiring the use of consistent government-wide standards. This new Federal Accountability and Spending Transparency Board would oversee a successor site to usaspending.gov. While the creation of the FAST Board will garner the lion's share of attention, the effort to create government-wide financial data reporting standards should not be overlooked. Indeed, the Sunlight Foundation supports another piece of legislation, the Public Online Information Act, that promotes the creation of government-wide data standards and sets up an entity with similar responsibilities. And here is more good news. Apparently, the White House agrees with the President, agrees with the Chairman, sorry, um, and vice versa. Yesterday, the White House announced an executive order that appears to contain some of the same elements as the Chairman's legislation. Because of these recent developments, we would like to submit additional written testimony on the Chairman's bill for the record, if that is agreeable. Without objection, so ordered. We all agree on a few basic principles. Government spending must be transparent. As citizens engage with government online, they must be met step by step with tools that empower them to track every dollar the government spends. We are cautiously optimistic that technology makes this dream attainable. And we all appear to agree that we need an independent board to do that, one such as the Data Act and the White House Executive Order have outlined. We need this because of the structure of government. OMB, for example, has multiple and sometimes conflicting responsibilities. It has the nonpolitical task of enforcing Federal financial spend, uh, reporting requirements, but it also must strive to avoid creating political problems for the President. And this is true whether we are talking about a Republican or a Democratic administration. 
These responsibilities clash when it comes to publicly criticizing agencies for their failings, such as when they do not fully report their spending. I had previously testified before this committee about our analysis of grants reported in USAspending.gov. We had identified almost $1.3 trillion in spending that failed to meet one of the three basic metrics we use, timeliness, completeness, and accuracy. But OMB has done little to correct the problems that we uncovered. When we recently revisited this analysis for 2010, the problems had not abated. And although much of the fault lies with the agencies, it is OMB's responsibility to publicly identify data quality problems and work to resolve them. In providing genuine accountability for government spending, the government must keep in mind three principles. First, transparency is government's responsibility. Second, public information must be online. Third, data quality and presentation matter. Data should be made available online in a timely fashion so that it can be easily found and reused by anyone, subject only to common sense limitations. I applaud the Committee's attention to these matters and thank you for the opportunity to discuss them with you today. And I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quinlan. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the Committee. <clears throat> My name is Patrick Quinlan and the CEO of Rivet Software in Denver, Colorado. To date, our company has helped over 1,300 of the top public companies in the United States transform the way they communicate their, final, their financial information to the public via the SEC. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony today on how to better leverage technology to achieve, to achieve transparency and accountability in Federal spending. The legislation that Chairman Issa has introduced and has been supported by the Vice President um, in, and the President in their own executive order requires the Board to designate consistent data standards for Federal spending information. Data standards are non-proprietary and a way of creating efficiency across databases for true transparency, similar to the barcodes that you mentioned earlier. In essence, a demand for transparency is also a demand for accountability. To accomplish this goal, we must start with a data standardization, as was discussed um, by the Honorable Mr. Devaney and by you, Congressman Issa such as XBRL, which is Extensible Business Reporting Language, is governed by an international nonprofit consortium and similar to HTML. XBRL makes documents content machine readable and instantly available for research. It is an open standard, owned by no one, but used by over 44 countries to manage data efficiently and accurately. Our government operates one of the largest data warehouses in the world, but fails to turn that data into real information. In effect, we are constraining innovation, wasting funds, and obscuring information, all in the native name of data transparency. Noble initiatives such as data.gov and USAspending.gov look good but are non-functional. They claim data is available and accessible, but if you cannot get an accurate answer, then it's not real information. On the other hand, recovery.org's data is incredibly powerful once converted into XBRL. At Rivet, we have developed a taxonomy creator to impose a new data structure on the recovery.gov data set. We can instantly determine, as an example, grant spending as distinct from loans and contracts by quarter and disperse from the Department of the Interior to my State of Colorado, a search that would have required multiple manual steps using the current XML stand format. Point being, we must find more opportunities to mandate data standards, and XBL is the data standard to help us get there. So what can this committee do to create true transparency in Federal spending? First look at the SEC for best practices. They have set and enforced a data standard using XBRL, which has developed a self-funded industry. The SEC's 2008 visionary mandate for XBRL has created at least 15 companies and roughly 1,500 jobs. Finally, here is an extra bonus. By passing this legislation, you will be creating jobs. With access to this tagged, accurate data, entrepreneurs will create tools with uses we cannot even imagine today. You will form a new, self-funded industry creating thousands of high-tech jobs and achieve true transparency and accountability. XBRL has the potential to become a tool as effective as the military's GPS technology. Now look at the myriad of applications, business jobs, and tax dollars generated that have been created by leveraging this data. The benefits of this new technology are lower cost, increased sharing, and enhanced communication. Federal fund recipients already spend too much time and money on compliance and reporting. 
Early XBRL adopters know that standardization makes compliance easier and reduces work. Many public companies have already saved money in both their internal and external reporting systems thanks to this technology. In conclusion, for us to move forward as a country, grow high tech and reduce the massive deficit, we must stop dealing with fuzzy numbers and start tracking where and how our money is spent. We stand ready to use the public government data to help people make better decisions as soon as the data is using the right technologies. But I hope, I will, but I hope it will not be just us doing that. The field will be wide open for new tech companies to make this data and make this more valuable. On behalf of my company in Denver, the thousands employed by our industry and the millions of Americans we serve, I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. We wholeheartedly endorse Chairman Issa's bill, and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Although you can go longer as long as you are talking like that. It is okay. Ms. Wallen. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member, members of the committee. For the record, I am Kim Wallen, Nevada State Controller. I am also the formal Global Chair of the Institute of Management Accountants, who was one of the early adopters and founders of XVRL. This morning, I want to talk to you about how grant reporting can be improved through standardization and using a widely used, freely available interactive data standard. Standardization is an important piece for improving transparency and accountability. In order to be able to compare apples to apples, the Federal Government needs to standardize what is being reported from agency to agency. To give you an example, the Department of Agriculture classifies fuel and lawn mowers as a supply and fuel and truck as fuel or travel. Other agencies call fuel, fuel or travel or supplies. In 2004, there was a document that started the framework for standardization across agencies. It was called Uniform Data Elements and Definitions for Grant Budgeting and Financial Reporting, Version 1. So we won't be starting from scratch. XBRL is the standard that I recommend for using for grant and contract reporting and other reporting requirements under the proposed bill. XBRL is non-proprietary and widely accepted. It complies with accounting principles and can be easily updated as new requirements come along. XBRL is about using good business best practices. XBRL is not a software or a product. It is a format for data that gives it structure and meaning. It is a standard that can be incorporated into software tools, much like how the HTML standard is used for building web pages. Let me share with you Nevada's experience with XBRL. A few years ago, the Department of Agriculture in our state was testifying and asked if they could have standardized reporting. Immediately, I looked at XBRL because it is about standardized reporting. We conducted a case study where we took their two larger EPA grant grants and used XBRL to do the grant reporting. Before XBRL, it was taking two weeks to prepare the report. Under XBRL, the report preparation re was reduced to a day or even an hour. XBRL helped meet the goals of the Department of Agriculture, which were timely and accurate data, stronger internal controls, reduced costs, standardization, and seamless data exchange. Additional benefits was that it was scalable and adaptable. A big concern from the State's perspective to implement this new proposed legislation is the cost of compliance. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to my peers and NASAC on what they think the additional cost would be. Besides for asking for money to help the States comply with the additional reporting and oversight, we need to find a way to streamline and eliminate redundant reporting and standardize the grant reporting requirements between all agencies. One way we could reduce the cost of compliance, the reporting burden at the same time, improve transparency and accountability would be to have a single repository where States would report. I envision this being similar to a white paper I wrote on using XBRL for the Nevada Business Portal. With a business portal, businesses only have to register in one place and all of their business registrations and tax reporting requirements can be filled at that one site. Many countries around the world are going to these very efficient portals. Australia now has a government-wide portal and they estimate filers are saving an estimated $800 million annually on compliance costs. If states could report through a similar single repository, the Federal agencies could go to that repository and generate the reports that they need. This would eliminate the redundant reporting in multiple formats that states are currently required to do. This will save millions of dollars in compliance costs for the states, as well as freeing up resources to allow for more time to do analytics and reduce improper payments. By using XBRL, the Federal agencies would be able to generate the reports that they need and not have to spend millions of dollars buying rigid proprietary systems. They would have more time to spend on analytics to look for fraud, waste and abuse. 
Had XBL been used for error reporting, it would have reduced compliant costs for the states, improved data integrity, and provided for more transparency. When states began reporting under the error requirements, the recovery board was still making changes to the template an hour after the reporting site opened. This caused errors to be made on the state side. Had they been using XBL, they could have made changes behind the scenes, which would not have impacted the states. To give you an example of what I mean, the FDIC has been using XBRL for their bank call reports for many years. When the FDIC decides to change what they want to see in a call report, they change it on their reporting site. Banks don't have to go in and change their systems, and oftentimes they don't know anything has even been changed. The FDIC saw the error rate go from having 30 percent errors to zero and data quality improving from a low of 66 percent to now 95 percent, and reporting time decreased from weeks to a day. XBRL goes beyond reporting and provides the mechanism to sort through mountains of information and to help governments to make informed decisions. Using XBRL will improve transparency, accountability, and give citizens and government officials alike better access to how we are spending taxpayer dollars and what we are doing with it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Jennings. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the subcommittee, my name is Craig Jennings and I am the Director of Federal Fiscal Policy at OMB Watch, an independent nonpartisan watchdog organization. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on this important topic on spending transparency and ways to improve it. We want to commend this committee for holding today's hearing and for efforts to increase access to accurate spending data. In general, we are very supportive of proposals to strengthen public access to government spending information. And such transparency is a nonpartisan issue, as demonstrated by the bipartisan co-sponsorship of the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006, the unfortunately acronymed FAFADA, where two senators with different ideological backgrounds work closely together to draft and advocate for the bill. We hope a similar approach is taken with the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, or the Data Act. On June 9th, we were given a summary and section by section of the Data Act, along with a briefing by committee staff. However, we did not receive a copy of the legislative language during that briefing, therefore cannot comment about the Data Act with any specificity. As with all legislation, the devil is in the details. Accordingly, we look forward to reviewing the legislative language and working with Chairman Issa as the bill moves through the House. Since it was formed in 1983, OMB Watch has focused on bringing greater accountability to our nation's spending. We played a leadership role in the passage of FAFADA. We also developed FedSpending.org, a website that implemented many of the goals of FAFADA by providing online searchable and downloadable tools to monitor much of the Federal Government's spending. Because of its success, Fed Spending was licensed to the Federal Government and became USAspending.gov. In other words, OMB Watch has nearly 30 years of policy and a practical experience with bringing greater accountability to Federal spending. And based on our experience, OMB Watch can recommend the following to drastically improve Federal spending transparency. First, improve data quality by publishing Treasury data. Agency reported obligation information is not the most accurate when it comes to how much was actually spent, that is, outlays. The best spending data comes from the Department of Treasury, the nation's checkbook. That data should be made available online and compared to recipient reports. I should also note that USAspending.gov per se does not have data quality issues. Rather, the Federal Assistance Award Data System, or FADS, one of the two data sources that are displayed on USAspending.gov is what is at issue here. Replacing USAspending.gov with something else will do nothing to fix the Federal spending data quality unless the problems inherent in FADs are addressed. Two, establish a unique, unique entity identification system. Each recipient of Federal funds should be uniquely identified across all data systems in government. We need to know if the ACME Inc. that received a contract from the Pentagon is the same ACME Inc. that received a poor contractor review by State is the same ACME Inc. that appears in EPA's toxics release inventory. It seems obvious, but there is no unique identifier system throughout government, and the current system used within USAspending.gov is deeply flawed. Without a comprehensive, universally unique identification system, Federal spending transparency will be hamstrung. This unique ID must include, at a minimum, the parent company ID, headquarters, and facility. Third, shine a light on the shadow budget of tax expenditures. In 2009, the Federal Government spent $556 billion in grants and $538 billion in contracts as reflected in USAspending.gov. By comparison, 
the government spent an estimated $1 trillion in FY 2009 through tax expenditures, which is not monitored by USAspending.gov. To see why tax expenditure transparency is necessary, consider that the home mortgage interest deduction and Section 8 housing vouchers are both designed to help Americans afford homes. From a housing policy standpoint, there is little difference between these two policies, but from a reporting and performance measurement standpoint, there is a world of difference. And finally, with respect to the preliminary information we received on the Data Act, I would say that the success of the Recovery Board was largely related to the funding it received from Congress. USAspending.gov has never received dedicated funds. Congress needs to provide funds sufficient for Federal spending, Federal accountability and this Federal Accountability and Spending Transparency Board to do its important work, and Congress should view this appropriation as an investment. We are generally supportive of the creation of a separate, independent agency charged with supporting Federal spending transparency. OMB Watch believes that the Recovery Board has been exemplary in overseeing Recovery Act transparency, and we would be pleased if a successor to it carried on its powers and its work for all of Federal spending. We are concerned, however, that the FAST Board would be sunset. Additionally, USA spending would, under the Act, also sunset, or would go away. Um, and we think that millions of dollars shouldn't be used to reinvent the wheel. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I recognize myself for the first round of questioning. Uh, you know, Mr. Jennings, uh, hopefully uh, as we negotiate with the administration on bringing together all these plans, uh, expenditures, particularly Treasury expenditures, will in fact be part of a manager's amendment in a final bill. As you can imagine, uh, and I, I think this is not a surprise to any of you, we can only go so far in proposing we need to make sure that we keep the President and, uh, and his administration where they mostly are now, which is on board in concept. Uh, but having said that, uh, Ms. Miller, I am going to ask you a particular question. The con one of the conceptual differences that has existed that we are trying to narrow is this whole question of OMB uh, and our belief, and I think I sh you share this with us, that they have an inherent conflict, that they will never, in fact, be the bad guys in the room insisting on enforcement. Do you want to elaborate any more on what the other, I mean, if we don't get an independent board, what do you see happening if, uh, if OMB were to take this over under the present structure of their multiple missions? Well, I think proceeding without an independent agency would be a waste of time. Um, and I think also the good news is the administration does appear to agree with you that these kinds of um, responsibilities with respect to monitoring spending putting it online, making it accessible for everyone, um, must be uh, created in an independent agency. And I would certainly agree with uh, Chairman Devaney's uh, comment uh, yesterday or earlier this morning that the most effective way to make this happen is to pass a law to make it happen. Yes, I was, he was very supportive of the body he was before, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I need to be with him with the President one time, as he says that, too. Uh, Mr. Quinlan, uh, you mentioned uh, fuel, or it was mentioned, the multiple reporting of fuel. But with your, uh, your software, and particularly using something like XBRL, wouldn't it be true that people could report fuel for automotive use, truck use, bus use, lawnmower use, and it could be aggregated so that one report would say, I just want to look at all fuel, another one could actually break it down? Isn't that one of the advantages of that kind of strength, the metadata? gives you to build tools so that you can look at, for example, fuel reported multiple different ways, but ultimately the user could determine what they wanted to see in a way that was meaningful to them. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And it goes back to the conversation that Chairman Delaney had, as well as Ms. Wallen, that it all starts with a common taxonomy. You need to create um, one accounting structure across the Federal Government uh, to, ensure, to ensure that fuel is fuel. But this is where XBRL can be helpful in the transition process. Um, by going in and mapping against that initial common taxonomy, we don't have to wait for everybody to make the change. We can start by mapping each individual cabinet's um, accounting structure um, or reporting structure directly into the newly created government structure, and we can start that reporting immediately. So um, XBRL and mapping allow that transition to happen seamlessly. Uh, 
Now, Ms. Wallen, I agreed with everything you said, but I was concerned at one, one part of your statement where you talked in terms of increased cost of reporting. Is it possible that if we do this right, other than transition cost, that we are actually driving down cost for your State? Aren't you, don't you see your vendors, your customers, your constituents reporting to you and reporting to us often? Uh, and additionally, don't you see yourself reporting as a State to multiple agencies? If we could reduce your reporting to one unified report, or at least any given activity only being reported one time, wouldn't that save you money? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, it definitely would save us money. It would reduce the redundancy that we have. It would reduce the confusion that you have. And it would give you the transparency that we need, because all the information would be in one site. So I agree with that. So we just have the incremental costs of the transition. Now I am going to ask a, a closing question to all of you. And it is deliberately off of what we are all talking about, government vendors and so on. But I am a Californian, so unlike Nevadans, I file a big income tax return to the State of California. And I have always wondered why I have to file two separate reports, why I don't report one time and let the Feds and the State that have to, in fact, verify each other's figures and deductions for us as Californians do their work. I understand separations. If we were to have a common platform for Nevada, doesn't that give you the ability in any aspect of your work to form compacts with the other states and gain access to information that might be proprietary to them, but ultimately of interest to you reciprocally? Isn't that one of the values of a single reporting is that assuming you are given access, you can get information that today you would have to go to your adjacent states go through disparate uh, databases to try to get information that you both may need in common? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I agree. Uh, if you take Australia with their government-wide business portal, that is what they have done. An uh, individual goes to file their taxes there, and it takes they're, actually, their software system has XBRL built into it, and they go and file with their unique identifier, and that takes care of all their filing, their payroll reports, their local prefecture reports, everything, and it's the sharing of data. Uh, we're using XBRL in our debt collection area here in the state, and we're actually going to start sharing information with cities and counties to collect. So the more commonality we can get, the more powerful we can be, and it reduces the cost of compliance. You would only have to file one return one time. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Jennings, you brought up the issue I did with the first panelist, and that was tax expenditures. Uh, obviously, you uh, support putting this information online, but uh, I guess the bigger issue is I am not sure most of the American public understands what tax expenditures are, their significance in policy, uh, the fact that they are not even within the budget. So I am not sure just putting them online is enough uh, for you and other panelists, including Ms. Miller, your recommendations to re elevate the awareness and understanding of the tax policy issues that go with tax expenditures, the lack of transparency, and how else can we let the world know about them? Well, I, I think the first thing about tax expenditures is just putting them alongside and making them analogous, <clears throat> excuse me, as they are to federal spending programs that are often debated within Congress, um, that come up in news reports. Um, it, when they are put on equal footing in terms of reporting and by considered by Congress as doing the same thing, one just happens to be a check written to an individual, one just happens to be done through the tax code, um, I think that would put them on the same footing as spending and make them equally well known as spending. Um, and the way it's done right now is that the IRS is running a massive subsidy program and all the information stays within IRS by law, uh, some of it totally appropriate, personal identif identifiable information, et cetera. Um, but the vast majority of it um, could be moved outside of the IRS and under the jurisdictions of committees that are responsible for their analog spending programs. And as we move that debate into the broader budget discussion, I think it will become um, equally well known. Ms. Miller. Um, um, I would certainly agree with Mr. Jennings' remarks. I mean, I think 
um, for the Sunlight Foundation, transparency for tax expenditures is very important for the obvious reasons. Um, you know, we are focused on transparency for government data across the, uh, you know, beyond the spending arena, which is the subject of, of this, uh, this hearing. And we think the more information that is put online, the more um, that members themselves and certainly members of the public can begin to understand the very nature of what government looks like, what it costs to, uh, to run government, what government's priorities are, um, as shown through tax expenditures. And so this is a general public education um, uh, uh, effort. But I also agree with Mr. Quinlan that the more of this information that is put online on par in parsable formats also creates new businesses, things that we cannot even imagine. So there is a multi multiple purpose um, in moving all, uh, all public information to being made available online in uh, parsable formats. But you don't just think it should be online. Do you believe that information like this should be within the Federal budget as well? Yes, we, we do think it should also be uh, available as part of the Federal budget. Mr. Quinlan? Um, I agree with Ms. Miller. And you can't just have reporting be the last mile. Reporting has to start um, at the beginning of the process. So again, by creating a common taxonomy that all, um, uh, that all areas of the government report against, and ensuring at the beginning of the budgeting process um, that that process is available actually would allow um, the American taxpayer to become a part of that discussion. The importance of financial communication um, begins with who understands the discussion that's happening. And I think right now it's very much the American government hears the rhetoric. Uh, sorry, the American people hear the rhetoric that comes out of it, but they're not able to go in and see for themselves what the rhetoric is about. And again, that is what a common taxonomy and XBRL can do for the discussion and for the outcome of that. How, how do you address this, this enormous quantity of information, though? I mean, there is sometimes just too much. How do you, given what you are trying to accomplish here as, as panelists and as, in your everyday lives, bring that down to a workable amount of information that folks can grasp and understand? Well, the Sunlight Foundation um, spends quite a bit of time both advocating for data to be put online in raw, machine-readable formats, but we also spend a huge amount of our time and effort in creating tools for people to have access together. And, and some of those tools actually mash data sets together to make it more understandable for citizens. And so that is the job in many cases of the private sector. It happens to be the heart of um, Sunlight Foundation's mission as well, which is to build tools to take different data sets and to enable uh, citizens or journalists to make sense of them as well. But if you don't have the raw data, then you have nothing to start with. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Congressman, actually, with using XBRL, the beauty of it is, is uh, Google just became a member of the XBRL International Consortium. And they are going to be putting together tools so people can use it to parse the data how they want to see it. When the Recovery Board did their report and put it online, they determined how they thought the U.S. citizens wanted to see the data. And that is the only way you could see it. With XBRL, people can go and extract that data and put it into any type of format that makes sense for them. That is the, that's the true power of it. So it is put into a format that there is lots of information out there, but XBRL gets it into the format that you want to see it in and how you want to look at it. So. Thank right. you, Mr. And, if I, and if I could add one last comment to that, I think to, to argue that it shouldn't be done because it may be too big is, uh, is I, I do not believe the correct approach. Um, I, when you look at what um, HTML has done for the searching of words on the Internet, so all of the information or a great deal of the information that is in the Internet today was available pre-1995. The difference is HTML allowed you to come in and tag a word and define what it is so people could search on it. And the amount of information available on the Internet is probably the one thing in the world that is actually larger than the Federal budget. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we are only talking trillions. You are talking peta. <laughs> yeah. Huge. <laughs> Mr. Labrador. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Wallen, um, can you give, please give us some detail about the current burden of Federal reporting that State and local governments are dealing with? Well, well 
part of the thing when we started with the stimulus, we had to go and report a lot of the same information to the agencies as well as to the recovery board. So you have got the duplicative reporting. And then they started asking us to do the subrecipient monitoring. Some of the smaller agencies, they didn't have the resources to try to do that. And I will admit that in our state, we are doing the best we can. Could we do better? Yes. And when we started out with the stimulus dollars with the additional reporting, we were really not given any additional resources to do that. Uh, the money uh, to recover our costs for doing the compliance was to be recovered through the SWICAP, the statewide cost allocation plan. In many cases, a lot of the agencies were already at their ceiling of the amount of money that could be charged for overhead. And so you just have to try to absorb it. Well, with the State's budgets being our State is struggling, we really didn't have the money there, and it took away money from other programs and what have you. Uh, I think the biggest problem is the, the duplication, the redundancy of the reporting. Um, if, if we could just go into one site and do it one time, I think it would make a lot more sense. And then also the confusion, this agency wants this, this one wants this, have that standardization. Because it, when you have got the laws and you have got people changing from one place to another, people are like, oh, they want this, they want that. And, and sometimes we ask our questions, why do you even need this? What do you do with it? Nothing. So. Okay. So do you think this will change under uh, a standardized system like if the Data uh, Act were enacted? Uh, Congressman, yes, I do believe that it will change. If we have got a single portal, a single repository we report, if we use standardization, if we use uh, interactive data standards such as XBRL, the nice thing is, is when the government, if you change the laws on what you want to see or how you want to see things, the states don't have to go in and reprogram their systems. You guys just do it on your reporting site. And so that would be a huge savings for the states. All right, thank you. Ms. Miller, um, as you know, President Obama signed an executive order uh, establishing a Government Accountability and Transparency Board. Do you think there are significant differences between the proposed Data Act, which would establish the FAST Board, and President Obama's new executive board? And if you do, what are those differences? Uh, we have not yet had a chance to review either the Chairman's legislation or the White House executive order um, in detail, but I had asked earlier if I could submit some additional remarks, and we will include those comparisons uh, in those additional remarks. You said in your testimony that transparency is the government's responsibility. How do you believe the government has for fulfilled this responsibility, especially with such efforts as USAspending.gov? Um, I think there have been significant really, truly significant strides um, in, uh, in this administration's efforts at creating a transparent and open government. Uh, I believe it could be done faster. I think it could be done better. I think um, one of the reasons that Sunlight supports the creation of an independent agency, the expansion um, of, the, uh, of the RAT Board, is because we think it could be done better if you have this independent entity particularly on the spending side of things. Um, you know, the new technology is, is really quite a marvel. Uh, the number of people who are going online to receive information, the numbers are, are uh, increasing astronomically. So while I think the administration has taken significant steps, um, we need to go much further, much faster. And this legislation, of course, would put many of the reporting res uh, responsibilities into law with enforcement mechanisms that we think are very important. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back uh, the rest I, of my time. If the gentleman would yield. Yes. Uh, going back, because we, we have an unusually uh, great amount of expertise on XBRL here, just a quick question. If, if, if all the states will take Nevada, for example, if you were if all your data was in XBRL format and multiple agencies wanted multiple information, isn't it essentially true that if you had all the information in a database, even if you had extraneous information, under XBRL, if you did a complete dump, they are still only going to get what they asked for because the rest of it is simply not going to be and they are not going to see it because they are not looking for it. So isn't that one of the strengths of this kind of database where you have uh, the, the wealth of metadata that 
as long as you give them what they want, whether you give them a little extra or one agency is looking for only a part of what another agency is looking for, isn't that the beauty of it is that Mr. Quinlan and, and, and your state can easily get what they want without having to, one dump does it all? Um, that is absolutely correct, um, uh, Chairman Issa. So, and that actually, there's, there's two parts to that answer. One is, if the data is all there, you are then able to ask the question that you want of the data and, and be able to identify what you are looking for. And that also then goes to the private sector. What will happen is when that data is available, just like Google was the window into all this HTML data that existed, there will be entrepreneurs throughout this great country that will create tools that will enable um, the media will enable regulatory agencies, will be able to uh, state agencies to go in and take the questions that they have and ask it of that metadata. Um, Mr. Chair, that is correct. And one of the things that you have is you have your taxonomy, which defines the definition of your data. So agency X over here can have their taxonomy for education. You can have a taxonomy for Department of Agriculture and they can pull what they need from it. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Jennings and Ms. Miller, as you know, budget negotiators recently slashed uh, funding for the Electronic Government Fund and the continuing resolution of FY 2011 from a proposed uh, $35 million down to $8 million. It's been reported that these cuts are putting websites such as data.gov, usaspending.gov, proponents.gov, and the IT dashboard at risk of being shut down. I know that both of your organizations joined a coalition of transparency and open government groups on a letter sent just yesterday to the leadership of the House Appropriations Committee Financial Services Subcommittee, urging them to restore funding for the Electronic Government Fund. Um, the letter said, uh, in part, and I quote, the eGov Fund has a proven track record of successful transparency, projects that have delivered efficiency uh, improvements and increased government accountability. For instance, USAspending.gov and the IT dashboard have helped to root out government waste and inefficiency and recently led to the elimination of some $3 billion in failing technolo te technology projects, end of quote. Your letter goes on to list several other websites aimed at improving transparency and accountability and promoting public participation and collaboration. Um, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that their letter be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Jennings and Ms. Miller, can you elaborate on the impact of the dramatic cuts to EGov, the EGov fund for FY 2011 and talk about the impact of potentially maintaining those cuts for FY 2011? Certainly. I, I think one of the things that um, the Nation's uh, Chief Information Officer highlighted in a letter uh, to Congress um, is the fact that needed improvements to data quality are going to have to be foregone because they don't have the money to do it. Um, there is, again, also other websites that were coming up that were intended to help uh, um, employees within the Federal Government share and exchange information and come up with better ideas uh, on how to do things. And, and that sort of collaborative element will, uh, was a pilot, uh, will, will, won't be continued. Um, so I think uh, we're already kind of seeing, as the reduction of funds happens, um, that these efforts are um, really hindering progress that was being made and now it's just been stopped. And the two things that you just mentioned, what is the significance of those? You just mentioned two things there, mm -hmm. that lack of money might cause two problems you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And how significant is that, those problems? Uh, well, I, I, certainly data, the, the data quality issue is, is hugely important, and I think it is one of the main reasons for this hearing and for the Data Act. Um, it is really hard to understate uh, the importance of getting the right information to the public. I mean, that is how we base our decisions on multiple things, policy, um, who to find for fraud, um, what kinds of programs should be extended or ended, however that may be. Ms. Miller. Um, I, I want to um, remind everyone of what uh, one thing that Chairman Devaney said about the establishment of, uh, of his board. He said, you guessed at the right number 
and having the resources at hand enabled him to, move, to, to really lift that agency into being an effective agency within six months. Uh, it was actually rather remarkable. Um, knowing what that right number is is a bit of a guess, although we now have you know, more experience with that. But there is no question that the figure is somewhere between 8 million that causes the administration to begin to reduce what it puts online or freeze what's online and 32 million that they proposed. I'm not, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's really hard to estimate it. But I think the committee must dig deeply into that to make sure that if it is indeed serious about creating um, this new board, uh, indeed serious about government transparency, that there is adequate money uh, to, uh, to, to make that happen. So in other words, we had to be careful because if you put too little money in it, you, don't, you, you lose your effectiveness and efficiency and you spend money. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it doesn't sound like what you're trying to say. You spend money and, in other words, you had to spend enough to get sort of like a bicycle and the old bicycles, you had to catch the train or the prime in the pump. But if you don't prime it enough, you don't get anything, but you've expended a lot of energy. Yeah, that's precisely correct. And again, um, we've, we've all heard the stories of the $3 billion um, that have been saved because of the, uh, the IT dashboard. Um, we know we don't have to spend $2.5 billion building these websites. So again, figuring out, taking the time to figure out what it does cost, recognizing the enormous potential for cost savings on the other side. Once the information is standardized, the uh, websites are built, the uh, citizen access is provided, and lawmakers, as, as well as citizens themselves, will have access to this and demand the accountability that is necessary. Well, certainly, I am sure we, we all, I think all of us, want to make sure that we spend the appropriate amount of money so that we can have the effectiveness and efficiency that we want. We understand that there will be savings and whatever, but we don't, definitely don't want to spend too little and at the same time don't want to spend too much. So I, I guess you got a good point there, some kind of way where we got to find the right point. Right. Well, we do have some experience now in terms of the cost of building some of these websites. Um, from which we can learn, and I think uh, the estimates uh, can be within the reasonable range. All right. Thank you very much. And I am going to recognize myself for a quick second round, uh, because the Ranking Member and I have agreed on a great deal here today and probably will agree on almost everything. But I want to ask a question that is not intended to be confrontational, but, but just because I voted for an overall package that did make those cuts. And it wasn't that I didn't that I wanted to make the cuts. To be honest, uh, I would have preferred we just leave those numbers where they were. But everyone was having cuts made that they wanted to make as a sacred cow, and that was one that that we were very upset about on our committee. But Ms. Miller, if I asked you to find enough websites that you've seen over the years that look good but provide no real effective data, in other words, they are mostly puff data sites, wouldn't you be able to find more than enough that, in your opinion, if you had to make a priority, you could shut down to grab that money? And that is asking you as, as someone who looks for meaningful data and sometimes finds it and sometimes doesn't. Well, I think the, um, the problem with the data sites that are out there that make your eyes hurt and you arrive at a website and you think, heavens, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I search anything? Um, those are websites from the last century, uh, just because they are The last millennium, perhaps. The last millennium, perhaps. Um, the last century not being so, so long ago. But I wouldn't suggest shutting those down. I would suggest improving them because the data, there is a lot of data uh, that is available online which is practically unusable. So the, the, ch the real challenge, I think, for us is to figure out what is our priority for fixing these? Because this data set that took our staff four days to find, uh, say, on mining safety, there was such a data set, uh, but it took us two or three days to find. What are the priorities for fixing these sites so they are actually usable? So I, I, I might actually end up actually going in the other direction, spending more money to um, identify these data sites, establishing some priorities, uh, particularly with respect to accountability data. Sure. Well, let me, let me go one more, uh, and I'm going to stay with uh, Ms. Miller, if I could. You, uh, 
you have the challenge that you have to work with what you, we bring you. I have the challenge that I have to figure out how not to start by, by simply saying, whatever it takes, I'll pay. Chairman Devaney did not have whatever it took. He had a very small budget. He had a very small amount of time. In six months, with less money than the other websites that we're talking about, and with less time than they've had since they knew that they were probably going to deal with budget cuts, he was able to prove things could be done, including cost savings that I've personally watched and gone through with their people, how they found the, the particular uh, uh, wrongdoing and, and stealing of Federal funds. So in a sense, wouldn't you agree that if we are going to get the additional funding back to pay for the transition and the ultimate better, better working sites that you want, wouldn't you say that it has to be part of a grand bargain where you say, and, oh, by the way, we want you to use best practices so that we know it is the minimum amount of dollars? That includes XBRL, cloud computing, and some of the other givens. Uh, yes, I would certainly, I would certainly agree with that. Um, in fact, I, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, we were quite critical of the contract uh, that was let to build uh, the uh, the RAT board. The, it was, seemed like an enormously expensive um, contract. Um, in fact, maybe compared to other government contracts, it wasn't that expensive. Um, but the but there also has to be, um, I mean, there ha there has to be a leader like Chairman Devaney at the head of these agencies who understand what it does cost or what the time implications are. Uh, but we would certainly agree with you. There, is, uh, there are cost savings. We don't want to spend too much, uh, but we have to figure out how much is enough to, to uh, stand these sites up and have the data available that we think is most important. Well, and that, with that, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I will recognize you in a second, but I, I want to tell you that I agree with you that we need to get that money back. And I would hope that we both work on a strategy to get that money back by having a plan that the President signs on to, the Vice President endorses, you and I work on, we get a few Senators, and we show where this transition money gets us where Chairman Devaney wants us and where I know you want to be. With that, you are recognized. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me, in answering and responding to what you just said, um, I am in total agreement. Um, I will join with you in trying to make sure we get the funds and keep those funds. It is just so very, very important. Um, in our mission statement, uh, we always, uh, one of the major lines is that we want to make sure that the people's money is spent effectively and efficiently. And this just seems to be a case that just cries out for striking that right balance so that we have sufficient funds. And so I am in total agreement. and. I pledge today to work very closely with you to accomplish that. I want to just pick up on um, something that, uh, going back to what the Chairman was talking about, just all this technology and, and how it all plays here. The Federal Government spends uh, nearly $80 billion annually on information technology, including software, computer equipment, and network devices that help the government run more effectively and efficiently. Earlier this year, Federal Chief Information Officer Kundra and the Administrator for Federal Procurement, Policy Daniel Gordon, and U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator Victoria Espinel issued a memorandum for Chief Information Officers and Senior Procurement Executives on Technology Neutral. The memorandum sought to remind agencies of the government's policy of selecting and acquiring information technology that best fits the needs of Federal Government, including a, a being uh, technologically and, and vendor neutral. I think this is an important principle not just for the Federal Acquisition Committee, but for Congress to keep in mind when crafting legislation as well. And this, I am getting to this is where I want to ask. I ask all the panelists if they agree and why or why not. Um, and it is my belief that, in general, the Federal Government lags far behind the private sector and technological development and advancement. I can imagine a, a scenario where we believe we are on the cutting edge of something, and in as much time as it usually takes to thoughtfully craft legislation, uh, negotiate with colleagues in the administration, see the bill become law, and then be enacted over time, you know, this is a long process, 
that the cutting edge technology has already been surpassed by something newer and better. Technology that uh, we have today, uh, this morning, is outdated this evening. So I hope that any efforts to improve Federal spending transparency and accountability through government-wide data standards uh, keep that in mind. And I would just like for you to comment on that, Mr. Quinlan, uh, and any of others of you, and how do we keep up? We, we, you know, go ahead. So again, I am going to use the HTML example because it is one, um, and technology does change very rapidly. HTML has been um, at the core of word search for over 20 years now. Um, XBRL does for numbers what HTML does for words, and most importantly, it is a completely open standard. Nobody owns it. Um, any company, whether a small entrepreneurial organization like ours or the largest technolo technology companies in the world, such as Google, anybody can work on that. Um, and so it is a standard that will stand the test of time. Um, it is a standard that, as Ms. Wallen spoke to, has been used by 44 countries around the world. Um, because it does allow for true transparency without ownership. Um, and that is why our founder, Mike Rowan, chose that as the technology 10 years ago. Um, and we very much agree with that. And um, I appreciate your question. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. If Jones. I may. Um, I, I, with respect to technology and the comparison to the private sector, it's, it's a little hard to do with the Federal Government. There's, there's different things going on in both in terms of mission and, and the kind of information they deal with. But first off, I would just say that some agencies are much better than other agencies in the technology uh, that they use. And I think it would be good to look at those agencies to see why it is it, they are able to harness such technology. Uh, the second point is that um, Technology is not the problem for a lot of the issues when we talk about Federal spending transparency. There is cultural issues um, that, um, that agencies have to get around to, to being open. Um, the second thing is there are conceptual issues in terms of when we talk about spending, what are we spending on? I know to, to get a little philosophical for you, it is what is a program? A program is different when it is appropriated than when an obligation is made than when it appears in the Treasury statements. There's different things that money gets attached to, and that has to be wrestled with. Um, the, as I mentioned before, there is also the issue of the unique identifier problem, that there isn't a unique identifier for entities, much less anything else in the Federal Government, uh, that extends not just within the executive branch, although that is a big problem, but also reaching back into the legislative branch in which decisions are made on how to fund things. So do we want to fund childhood nutrition? What are those programs within childhood nutrition? Um, we need to understand all of that and how they relate and be able to see that within the data. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman and I thank our witnesses for being very helpful. Uh, it is always hard to follow Chairman Devaney, but you showed very well that you are up to the task. Once again, thank you. We stand adjourned. <laughs>